delighted to be with you once again today. I trust that you've had a good night's rest. And I appreciate very much your being with us again for another lecture on Islam. I want to take this opportunity to express to the good ladies of this church my profound appreciation for the good meal yesterday. All you men say amen. amen. And I'm looking forward to another outing at the barn. I was talking to my kids last night and I told them I ate in a barn and they were really interested. They want to try eating in the barn sometime. Sometimes I wish they are acting like they live in the barn. But <laughs> I have been encouraged by this lectureship, by getting to know people of whom I have known in name, but now to put the faces with the men and women. I know that Brother Steersman, I think, has already left. I really did enjoy spending some time with him. And to the Doherty's, they have been very kind. Sister Doherty tried to kill us last night. She had the biggest turkey and everything, all the fixings therewith for a wonderful supper. She's such a sweet lady, and I know she's a tremendous asset to Brother Doherty. Let me say just a few words about the book that I'm preparing on Islam. The title of it is Christ or the Quran, A Christian Approach to Islam. You might be wondering why I chose that title. It seems that I should contrast Christ or Jesus and Muhammad. But in Islamic theology, the Quran is not the counterpart to the Christian scriptures, to the Bible. The Quran is the counterpart to Christ. The Quran is considered the enlibrated Word of God, the Word that became a book. Therefore, the Quran has a very sacred status in Islamic theology. And once again, the Quran, therefore, is the counterpart to Christ in Christian theology. The book hopefully will be out after the first of the year. It just depends how long Bert is going to send it through the editorial process. Some of you who know Bert Thompson, he is rather fastidious. He's a somewhat of a perfectionist, and that's why he produces such good material. But he looks at the commas, he looks at all the punctuation, and um, even the typesetting, and sometimes I want to slap him. Is, is this being recorded? <laughs> I, I forgot. Back it up just a minute. He's a wonderful man. Now stop. <laughs> so I don't really know exactly when it will come out. I'm trying to write it on as popular a level as possible. There are some very good critiques of Islam available. More of a scholarly nature, for instance, Norman Geisler, along with Abdul Salib, has written a rather extensive uh, expose of Islamic theology in their book, Answering Islam. And if you're interested in that, I think it was published by Baker Bookhouse. You might want to get a copy of it. But hopefully, if it is the will of God, the book will be out after the first of the year. And we will let you know when it comes out. Yesterday's lecture was, I realized, quite tedious as we were looking at some of the historical background of Islam. And I want to commend you for staying with me. Uh, history is not always that uh, exciting of a lesson. Sometimes it is absolutely essential for us to get a grasp of the subject matter. And because of the vast amount of historical background that I tried to bring yesterday, I got about half through with that lecture. And as most preachers are, I am tempted to try to get the other half of that lecture in with this lecture, and I know what would happen. So 
So I'm simply going to leave it where it was and turn my attention to a critique of Islam. But the critique itself is not going to be looking at specifically the problem so much as it is showing the points of tension between Christianity and Islam. Several chapters in my book will deal with a critique of the Quran, and that might be of some interest to you and of some help. I hope it will. But I have come to the conclusion that when you do a comparative analysis of these two world religions, Christianity and Islam, it becomes apparent which one is the superior religion. And so, though this is not a technical critique of Islam, it is nonetheless exposing the errors of Islam in light of the Christian faith, and in so doing, I think that we will be able to see that Islam is a much far inferior worldview than is the Christian worldview. But once again, as we introduce our lesson this morning, I want to reiterate what I said yesterday about the proliferation of Islam. Islam is not isolated to the peninsula, the peninsula of Saudi Arabia or to the Middle East. As of last figures, the population of Muslims are now reaching one billion adherents to that religion. Now, to put that in perspective, that means that one out of every five people on this planet is a Muslim. Now, certainly that does not mean, as statistics can be deceptive, that here there would be a constituency of Muslims. Not every fifth person you come along within that group would be a Muslim because there would be larger populations of Muslims in different areas. But it does kind of put in perspective for us what is happening in our world. To bring that on domestic soil, there are now over 1,100 mosques or Islamic organizations in our country. Therefore, I'm suggesting to you that while at one level we might be isolated from some of the problems of our world and the different thinking of our world in certain areas. Just like Bruce mentioned yesterday, it is becoming more and more commonplace to meet people who hold to views other than the Christian worldview. And that is something that we must be able to address. You take that with the globalization of our world in which we now have access to so many different cultures through the world wide web. And some of you know what it means to surf the web. That is becoming a pastime for a lot of people. And on that world wide web you have access to a plethora of information of all kinds, very helpful and very dark. And if you were to search on the World Wide Web for Islamic organizations, you will fill up your cash. For those of you who know what I'm talking about, very quickly. So the fact of the matter is, we are no longer living in an isolated world, but it is becoming more and more of a global society, and that is going to be the challenge, I think, of the 21st century for the church to present Jesus to those of differing worldviews. But now having said that, before we begin looking at the theology of Islam, I think we need to issue some warnings, some preliminary considerations. I know that in my own experience, that when I would hear the term Islam or Muslim, there would be certain kinds of images that would come to my mind. I was in high school during the Iran hostage crisis. You remember that. Uh, who was the president? Carter. And I remember watching every night the images of these fanatical 
Arabian people parading those American hostages in blindfolds before the cameras. And so therefore I began to associate Islam with fanaticism. And the fact of the matter is there are many fanatical sects within the Islamic community. But let me also suggest to you that those fanatics with the stubbled faces and cold stares are not necessarily representative of every Muslim. Islamic writer Mubashar Ahmad has rightly suggested that simply critiquing Islam through the lenses of those fanatical Islamic sects would be like someone trying to understand Christianity by reading the news of what's happening politically and religiously in Northern Ireland or of apartheid in South Africa. We would not say that what is happening in Northern Ireland politically and religiously would be representative of Christianity. At least don't paint me with that same brush stroke. We have organizations within our own country like the skintheads that are very racist who proclaim an adherence to Christ and to Christianity and present Jesus to advance their own political agenda. Don't paint me with that same brushstroke. And for a Muslim, therefore, to say, well, look at that fanatical Christian sect. Look what kind of people all Christians are. That would not be fair, would it? We need to be careful that we don't do the same thing with Muslims. The fact of the matter is, those who have been to that country would tell you that they are some of the most hospitable people in the world, generally speaking. And secondly, as far as Muslims in the Middle East are concerned, we need to try to understand the anti-West slash U.S. sentiment among many of those people and why they hold to those negative views of our society. Well, first of all, in the 11th century A.D., through about the half of the end of the 13th century A.D., there were a period or several crusades that Western society made into the Middle East to retake Jerusalem for Jesus. And during this period, both Islamic countries and quote-unquote Christian countries, and let me stop here and put this footnote. As far as the Islamic mind is concerned, the West is associated with Christianity. And so the Crusades from their perspective, would have been a Christian offensive. And during the Crusades, both Islamic countries and Western countries left their casualties, and that created a great deal of tension between the two worlds. And the Crusades are indelibly etched in the mind of the Muslim. Secondly, the colonial period in which about 90% of all Muslim countries were subjugated by the West have left many Muslims with a sense of revenge for such humiliation. But thirdly, perhaps the greatest blow to the consciousness of Islam or of Muslims would have been after 1,300 years of occupying Jerusalem the Jews regained occupation of that area. And they blamed that reoccupation on the Christian West for creating the state of Israel in 1948. Now, while we can legitimately object and say that you have read history through your own skewed lenses, nonetheless, these things form the core of their understanding of Western nations, and that's why they react so violently to Western civilization. Saddam Hussein calls the West Satan. 
And it's because of that long history of perceived casualties in the mind of the Muslim. And we need to be very sensitive to that. But now having laid that out, and, realize, uh, and realizing also from a preliminary perspective that Islam is not a monolithic system of belief. But as we tried to show very briefly yesterday, it is very heterogeneous. There are many sects and different thinkings and theologies within Islam. We simply cannot, with one broad, uh, broad brush stroke, isolate one sect and make that representative of all Islamic sects. But what we can do is try to focus on the core beliefs of Islam that transcend those sectarian boundaries in the Islamic community. So that's what I want to address myself to for the few minutes we have remaining this morning are some of the core beliefs of Islam that are diametrically opposed to the Christian system. And hopefully in doing that comparative analysis, we can come away with an appreciation of what the biblical text says about God and Jesus and his church and see the superiority of that to the Islamic theology. This apologetic approach was taken largely in the book of Hebrews, wasn't it? When the Hebrews writer simply compared and contrasted Jesus and the Christian system with Moses and Judaism. And out of that, he said that Jesus is much greater than those specific personalities in the Mosaic economy. So, let's dig in then together. I'm going to bust this light again. Let me turn it off while I do that. First of all, I want us to look at the Islamic concept of God. God. Who is God? Now, for the Muslim, Allah is the personal name for God. Now, there is a running debate among scholars as to exactly what Allah means, the etymology of Allah. Some suggest it means one, which is consistent with the rigid monotheism of Islam, to which we will address ourselves in more detail in just a moment. Some suggest that Allah is a specific God that is distinct from our understanding of God, not just conceptually, but linguistically. In other words, Allah is a separate linguistic designation for God than is the English term God. And there are people that you can stack up on both sides. Out of the research that I have done, I have come to the conclusion that Allah basically is the Arabic term for God and that it basically has the same objective referent as does the English term God. And to suggest that there are some linguistic dissimilarities or differences between Allah and God, I think, introduces unnecessary confusion to the comparative analysis of these two world religions. But having said that, that is not to say that when the Muslim says God, that he or she means the same thing when I say the word God. Uh, for instance, some of you might have read uh, Stephen Hawking's best-selling book, A Brief History of Time. Stephen Hawking is the famed theoretical physicist of Cambridge University. And on practically every page when he is developing his black hole cosmology, and if you want to know what that means, ask Brother Doherty, he'll tell you. Bruce, that is. Oh, yeah, Bruce. On practically every page, he would use the word God. And because of that, some came away with the idea that Stephen Hawking was a profound believer in God. But what Hawking meant by the term God is much different from what the Bible means when it evokes the name God. For Hawking, God is simply the fortuitous and orderly working 
of natural laws in our universe. But God in the biblical text is a being that transcends the universe and brought the universe into existence. So as we approach the idea of God in Islamic theology, we need to understand what they mean when they use the Arabic term for God, Allah, as opposed to what we mean when we say God, or particularly what the biblical writers meant when they said God. There are a couple of things that I want to look at under this particular category. Number one, it is true that Islam is a monotheistic belief system. Islam believes in one and only one God. One of the surahs, which is the, as you recall, the Arabic word for a chapter, basically. Uh, number 119 speaks of God as the one and only, the unique, the eminently indispensable to whom no one is comparable. Now, on the surface, I agree with that. In fact, on the surface, biblical writers would agree with that. Take, for instance, the Shema in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. That formed the liturgical foundation for the community of Israel. This is what they would confess. Much like the Islamic creed, La ilaha illa Allah, Muhammad and Rasulullah Allah. There is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is the prophet of Allah. The Israelites would say Shema, that's the Hebrew word for hear. Shema Israel, that's the vocative. Hear, O Israel, Shema Israel Eloheinu Yahweh. Yahweh Eloheinu, God, Jehovah, is our God, Yahweh Echad. Yahweh alone. And of course, that particular verse is fraught with lexical and syntactical difficulties. But all of the proffered translations, I would suggest that this reading is the best. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh is our God, Yahweh alone, which forms the monotheistic foundation for Israel in contradistinction to the polytheistic belief systems of their contemporaries. Further, if you look at what Surah 119 says about, or 112 says about Allah, that he is eminently indispensable and to whom no one is comparable, several biblical texts also will talk about the incomparable nature of Yahweh or God. Isaiah 40, for instance, and Isaiah 43. A polemic against idol gods. In that text, Isaiah said, as the mouthpiece of God, of course. To whom will you liken me? And who is my equal? And those questions carry with it the rhetorical thrust of the negative answer. No one is like you. No one is your equal. So at least on the surface, it appears that the monotheistic belief system of Islam is consistent with biblical revelation but that is only a superficial similarity. Because Islam has a very rigid form of monotheism. It is a mathematical singularity when they talk about God is only one, the only unique. In the Christian system, however, the monotheism allows for pluralism within the divine essence. We call that the Trinity. Islam very explicitly denies the concept of Trinity. That is very foundational to the Christian belief system. In fact, in Surah 4, Muhammad condemns the people of the book, which is a designation for both Jews and Christians, but here specifically Christians, for calling Jesus Trinity. And anyone who would associate someone with God 
like you do Jesus, you have absolutely no forgiveness. That is shirk. It is blasphemy. And there is no forgiveness for it. So Muhammad was very pointed in his denunciation of the idea of the Trinity that was prevalent in the Christian belief system at that time because it has biblical foundation. And to look at that for a moment, let me say that we need to be careful in establishing the Trinitarian construct of God. I know that I have heard people discuss the Hebrew term Elohim, which is plural, and suggest that in that word itself there is the idea of the Trinity. Well, that's not necessarily the case. God's name is always in the plural in the Hebrew text. The difference between the true deity, Elohim, and the idols, which also were called Elohim, is that when the true God is mentioned, a singular verb would be attached to it. When the pluralistic gods of the contemporaries of Israel were under consideration, a plural verb would be attached to it. Take, for instance, Genesis 1.1. Barashith, bara Elohim. Elohim is the word for God. But bara is the third person singular of the verb to create. So you have a plural noun with a singular verb suggesting that God is so awesome and so above what we can comprehend that a singular word simply could not encompass the term itself, or the being himself. So the Hebrews would use the plural to suggest majesty. It's called the plural of majesty. But having issued that warning, or critique, so to speak, there are indications in the Old Testament that there was this pluralistic construct of God. For instance, what did God say in Genesis 1, 26 and 27? Let us make man in our image, and therefore in the image of God he created them. Male and female created he them. You notice our and he. There is this clearly monotheistic understanding of God, yet within the monotheism of Israel, within the monotheism of the biblical text, there is this inherent pluralism. And Matthew brings eloquent expression to that concept when he says in Matthew chapter 28 to go into all the world and make disciples of every nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And without taking up much more time on this, you can go through the New Testament and find that the Father is spoken of as God, that Jesus is spoken of as God, and that the Holy Spirit is spoken of as God. To the Islamic mind, however, to suggest that God has these compeers, these associates, is blasphemy. So this is a very large distinction between the Islamic concept of God and the Christian concept of God. The Islamic concept of God is rigidly monotheistic, a mathematical singularity, whereas the monotheism of the Christian belief system allows for plurality within the monotheistic construct. But having questioned, therefore, the Trinity, by implication, the Islamic theology also questions the idea of the deity of Jesus. Not only by implication, but quite explicitly, the Quran says in Surah 4, that Jesus, the Messiah, is only an apostle. And to assign divinity to him, once again, is blasphemy. Well, I don't think I need to stop very long here and suggest to you that to question the deity of Jesus is to question a foundational tenet of Christianity. Because Jesus is God. Uh, for instance, let's just take one verse and then move on. John 1, 1 through 3, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God. Now listen, and the Word was God. 
Not only was there this association with God, but the Word in essence also was God. And all things were made by Him, that is the Word, and without Him was not anything made that was made. He is God, the Creator. And down in verse 14, John says very plainly that this Word who was with God and was God became flesh and dwelt among us. So particularly the Gospel of John is very clear in presenting Jesus as God. Oh, let's take another text. This is so interesting to me. I hope it is to you. In John chapter 8, when Jesus was in debate with the Pharisees, what did he say toward the end? About verse 52. Before Abraham was, I am. And you see this phrase, I am, throughout the Gospel of John, ego a me, in the Greek. If you were to look at the Greek version of the Old Testament back in Exodus 3, in verse 14, where God said to Moses, I am that I am, the Septuagint translates that, ego a me. And for Jesus, therefore, to say before Abraham was, ego a me, they knew exactly what Jesus would say that I am Yahweh. This is something for the Jehovah's Witnesses to consider. Because the term I am in the Hebrew, a yea, comes from the same root that the term Yahweh or Jehovah comes from. A yea is what God said to Moses. A yea, asher, a yea, I am that I am. And a yea is the first person imperfect of the verb to be. When God speaks of himself, he says, I am when Moses spoke of that being God, he said Yahweh, which is the third person singular of that same verb to be. He is the self-sustaining one. So when Jesus said before Abraham was ego a me, he was saying that I am Yahweh of the Shema. I am Yahweh, your God, Yahweh alone. And that's why they took up stones to kill him. So Islam, in their monotheistic construct of God, repudiates the Trinity and the deity of Jesus, which causes a great deal of friction. I think that shows us very clearly that the two systems are totally incompatible. And it would only be a deadly compromise by either the Muslim or the, Christian, or the Christian for these two to be embracive of one another. These distinctions are simply too fundamental and too sharp. But secondly, about the monotheistic uh, construct of Islam, let me say this. What they believe God to be is far different from what the Bible says. His essential characteristics. In Islam, God basically, or Allah basically, is a personification of will. Uh, scholars will call this a voluntaristic idea of God. And voluntarism is any philosophical theory that regards the will not the intellect as the primary factor in experience or the will is that which determines ultimate reality. So the concept of God in Islamic thought is a form of voluntarism in that the divine will determines his ultimate reality. In other words, in Islamic thought, God is what God does. There is no essential characteristic that prohibits or compels God to do anything. God is whatever God wills to be in Islamic thought. And this is very important. I hope that I can articulate this carefully enough for you. For instance, in Surah 6, God says... I am merciful because I decree mercy for myself. Let that sink in. At the top of every one of the surahs in the Quran, you will have 
the phrase Allah, the merciful, the compassionate. Certainly admirable attributes indeed. But the teaching of the Quran itself says that God is merciful not because there is some inherent quality within the divine essence that compels him to mercy, but because God said, I decree mercy for myself. Therefore, God does things in Islamic thought not because they are right, but they are right because God does them. Now, that's a big difference between the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible is merciful because of essential qualities within the divine essence that compels him to mercy. Look at one verse, for instance, Ephesians 2 and verse 4. After Paul very clearly described the hopeless status of those who were dead in trespasses and sins, you have the response of God to the reality of sin, but God. You see that? God responds to the reality of sin in verses 1 through 3. But God, listen carefully, who is rich in mercy, okay, here's the connection between the God of Islam and the God of Christianity. They're both merciful. But why is the God of Islam merciful? Because that God simply wills mercy for himself. But the God of the Bible is merciful. Why? Because of the great love with which he has loved us. There is this essential characteristic in the Christian divine essence that compels God to mercy and prohibits him from certain actions. For instance, God cannot lie. In Islamic thought, taking this concept of God, God can do whatever God wants to do. And when God wills himself to do something, that in and of itself becomes right even if it is lying or anything like that. But the God of the Bible, however, because of the essential qualities of that divine essence, he is prohibited from and compelled toward certain actions. And that is a big difference. And thirdly, in the Islamic concept of God, the Muslims view God as being very transcendent. He is detached from far above the physical universe and the human condition. Rather impersonal. This is what has driven many scholars to suggest that really the God of Islam is simply a personification of fate. Uh, we were talking about uh, yesterday, I believe, Bruce, the rigid form of determinism in Islamic theology. If Allah wills it, so that whatever happens, whatever I think, whatever I do, it's something that this God simply willed me to do, even if it is immoral or moral or whatever the case may be, Allah wills. And that stems from this highly transcendent idea of God, the personification of will, with no divine or essential characteristics. But you look at that idea of God in relationship to the biblical idea of God and you see something very different. Something much more compelling from my perspective. In the biblical text, yes, God is a transcendent God. He is not a part of the physical universe. That's what the phrase is, the Holy One of Israel. He is not a man. He is God. Therefore, he does not partake of the same physical nature as the universe. He is transcendent. He is above it. But not only is he transcendent, the biblical text also says that he is very imminent, close by very connected and concerned in a personal way with his creation. And so you have the God of the Bible, unlike the God of Islam, trying to get his creation's attention from the very beginning of sin. You recall that when Adam and Eve sinned, what did they do? Well, they sowed fig leaves and then they hid from God. And what did God say when he first came into the Garden of Eden? Adam, 
Where are you? It's not that God did not know that Adam was hiding behind that tree. God knew full well where he was, but he was trying to get Adam's attention to let him know, to get him to see where he really was in relationship to God. Do you realize where you are? This is not my plan for my creation. And hence you have the God of Israel, the God of the Bible from that time forward, trying to get the attention of his creation. One text, Isaiah 65, is very interesting. I was sought by those who did not uh, ask for me. I was found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am, here I am, to a nation who was not called by my name. Do you see the image there? God saying to Israel, here I am, here I am, trying to get their attention, though they were so rebellious. My time's almost gone. It looks like I'm not going to get to my other three points, but that's okay. But this text is so meaningful to me. As you know, I have four kids. And this might be hard for you to believe, but every Friday night we have a ritual, a family ritual, and that is about 9 o'clock when it's good and dark, I and the four kids, Three kids, not the two-year-old yet. We go outside and play hide-and-seek. One of these days, I know the police is going to be called. There is a strange man in the bushes across the street. Well, when Zachary, who was about three years old when he first started playing hide-and-seek with us, he didn't have the concept of hide-and-seek down very well. When I was it, and I'm usually it because I'm the most fun being it, they think, Zachary was hiding in the bushes. I knew where he was. But as I would walk around the side of the house, you would hear the rustling of little feet against the dry leaves, and then you would hear this little giggle. (laughs) And before I could even get close, he would jump out and say, Here I am, here I am. And I would say, no, 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 wait a minute, Zach. Wait, wait just a minute, son. You don't understand what hide-and-seek is all about. You're supposed to stay hidden. But upon retrospect, I think that Zachary understood more of the object of hide-and-seek than I did. Because the fun is not in hiding, but in finding and being found. And here you have God saying, here I am, here I am. And yet people apparently simply walk by and do not hear the voice of God through his prophet Isaiah calling them back to a relationship to him. I want to suggest to you that that is such a far different view of God than in Islamic theology. Because the God we serve is a God who is concerned about you, about me. And he's concerned about us because his essential characteristics compel him to show mercy, to show grace, to extend an invitation to fellowship with him on a very intimate and personal level that is something the Muslim simply cannot have in that belief system because God is so transcendent and detached. Along with that idea of God, the Quran, let me just say, denies the atonement of Jesus, very explicitly says that Jesus was not killed and that he only was a prophet, the son of Mary, not the son of God. And the means of salvation in Islamic theology is totally works-oriented, whereas in Christian thought, It is by the grace of God as we respond in an expressive faith. So because of their concept of God, the Muslim cannot live from day to day in confidence of his or her salvation, whereas on the other hand, in Christian thought, according to the Bible, we can be confident of our salvation because of what God did for us at Calvary. And I suggest to you 
that by simply comparing and contrasting these two systems, the superiority of Christianity is apparent. And I encourage you, as we reflect upon who we are and upon who God is and upon what Jesus has done for us, to thank God for His grace and the faithfulness